Well, this panel is intended to provide broad perspective of the context for in which it takes place the interaction between urbanization and global environment to change. Uh, we thought it would be very helpful to address issues that normally are not addressed in the context, or not always addressed in this context. Um, we have three presentations. Uh, unfortunately, we, one of the presenters um, uh, lost one of his slides and, and he is not able to be today with us. Uh, but we have his presentations and he said some bullet points that we would use to describe uh, his presentation. Um, let me uh, begin to introduce the panel. Um, we have three distinguished panelists. It's, it's an honor and a privilege to have them together. Uh, we have Alejandro Nadal. Uh, Dr. Nadal is a professor at the Center of Economic Studies of the Colegio de Mexico. He received his PhD in economics from the University of Paris in Nanterre in nine, well, I won't say it was <laughs> He's a chair of the team of the Environment and Macroeconomics Trade and Investment. Uh, of CESP IUCN, and he's a co editor of the online academic journal of economic thought of the World Economics Association. Professor Nadal's policy editor column in La Jornada, one of the major newspapers in Mexico. Um, <coughs> and he will be addressing the issue of, of the economic context of global economic context of financial uh, markets. We have also Professor. Harini Nahendra, Professor Nahendra is a professor of the School of Development at Sin Remji University of Bangalore, India. She is also an Asian Research Coordinator at the Center for the Study of Institutions, Population, and Environmental Change of, at Indiana University, and was recently the Humbert Home, the Humbert Home Opera. Um, distinguished visiting professor at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Her research examines issues of social ecological sustainability in forests and cities in the global south. And our third speaker who is missing is Professor Roberto Guimaraes, who holds a BA in Political Administration and an MA and PhD in Political Science. His current functions include principal investigator in the research dimensions, social ecological dimensions, and the Siguantades Net in Germany. He's a member of the board of directors of the IFE in Initiative for e Equality in the US, and visiting professor of the doctoral program on environment and society at the State University of Campinas in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Previously, he acted as vice chair and chair of the scientific committee of the ISDP International Program of Human Dimensions of Global Environmental Change. So these are our three distinguished panelists, and I would like to ask Alejandro Navarro to start with the economic dimension. And then we want to go to the stage. Yeah. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, have this, this opportunity to learn from you because uh, I told Roberto, uh, an economist, I've done work on economic theory and applied economics, a lot of work on small scale agriculture, um, fisheries, uh, climate change, but not on cities, urban environments, uh, and uh, the, the important themes that all of you are concerned with and that you are experts. So please be patient with me if I say things that are very obvious and um, as I say, I'm, I'm here to learn. I'm, uh, I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm old, uh, but you always learn and I think this is a, a great opportunity to talk about some of the things that concern me uh, in the field of macroeconomics. That's uh, uh, where I've been doing work in the last uh, uh, I guess 20 years now, ever since we had the crisis in 1994 in Mexico. So um, <clears throat> I'm um, worried and I'm concerned.
concerned about the uh, lack of attention that uh, macroeconomics gets in a lot of debates on sustainability, uh, environmental and social sustainability, that is. And uh, I guess this is why I, uh, uh, Roberta asked me to uh, be here and talk with uh, all of you. Okay, so uh, the title of, of my presentation is, uh, I really hesitated a lot and I came up with this, I guess it would be easier to call it just macroeconomics and cities. And as I was, uh, this, you know, um, okay. um, I came up with, with an idea to say, you know, is, is there a connection between macroeconomics and cities after all? If you look at uh, Rio Plus 20, the Rio Plus 20 conference in 2012, came out with a document that was entitled The Future We Want. This was the outcome document. And if you look for the word urban, it appears 19 times. The word cities appears 11 times. And the word macroeconomics is never even mentioned, not once. So this is the outcome document of the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Developments. And that was really paraded for the previous two years to, uh, to 2012 as the most important conference on sustainable development. I attended a couple of uh, conferences that were designed to get inputs to shape the agenda and some of the things that we should be discussing in Rio. And the line I always took there was, hey, we need to talk about uh, Microeconomics, and we need to talk about the crisis. The world was in 2012, uh, it, we don't need to talk about the crisis, but it, in 2012, it, it was really engulfed in a very, very serious, uh, what I call a depression, and uh, many other economists call it a depression. So, you know, it made a lot of sense to talk about microeconomics and the crisis in, uh, in Rio, but somehow uh, this really didn't materialize. There is only one entry in the entire document okay, on macroeconomic policies. And then this is the phrase where it comes from, you know, it's a, it's a nice sentence, but it doesn't go into any kind of analysis. And the word crisis appears once in reference to climate crisis. So the economic crisis, which was the deepest economic crisis in 80 years, uh, was not a theme that was considered to be of any importance in Rio Plus 20. And for, uh, I guess for all of us, but certainly for, for, for me coming from the field of macroeconomics, it's like, you know, I was really going crazy. What are these guys talking about in Rio de Janeiro? You know, they're really missing one of the most important uh, elements in, in the entire picture. But hey, maybe, maybe the Rio Plus 20 outcome document is not that inaccurate. I was asking myself all the time. You know? Perhaps there is no connection between macroeconomics and cities. Maybe there isn't any connection. You know, for all we know, what you know, what do we have in the literature to prove that? Um, macroeconomists don't care about cities. They don't care about spatial relations. They don't care about the environment. Okay, they care about certain aggregates and the way they add up together or that or they don't add up together. Okay? So here I was in my desk saying, you know, what am I gonna be talking about? Maybe there is simply no relation between macroeconomics and the urban environment. But then again I started thinking and I looked at the global macroeconomic and financial crisis, which is something that occupies our attention uh, a lot. And if you look over here at the top, uh, oops, very far away, the global macroeconomic crisis that erupted in the fall of 2007, okay, it was closely related to cities and their role in capital accumulation. So immediately, you know, you see there is a very important connection. Not that I have been working on this connection, but I'm attracted by this as I came here to, to this conference and started to look at the timeline of the global crisis. So since the 1970s, you have incomes stagnating, uh, households 
uh, increasing their indebtedness. Uh, you have uh, a series of events in the financial world, financial deregulation, um, also stemming from the fact that in the 1970s your entire international system of payments collapsed, the Bretton Woods system collapsed, and this opened new doors for speculation and for the development of finance capital. Okay? Um, you had low interest rates uh, at certain key periods in the last 30 years in the United States. I'm talking about the United States here, but some of these things are translated directly to all advanced develop, developed capitalist economies in Europe. Certainly the stagnation of wages. This is something that is really amazing, but it is a well-documented fact. And, um, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you have the, the, um, the real estate bubble developing as a result, as a combination of, as a result of this combination of events, stagnant wages, wages uh, lose their importance as the key element for the reproduction of labor force, if you want to put it in those terms, okay? And that becomes the fact that you use uh, real estate as a key asset for uh, indebtedness and for capital accumulation and growth. Okay, so this is where your uh, mortgage loans come in and your subprime. Uh, to the next slide. Uh, to the to the, uh, the subprime uh, segment of the mortgage uh, market. You also have global imbalances, which I'm going to be talking uh, a while. But uh, a key element here is the role of finance capital uh, as it enters the space of home ownership in low income strata. And you have the development of mortgages, and of course, we're talking real estate, property, urban property. So, oh, here's my connection with cities. So, macroeconomics is and must be closely related to things that happen in cities. Uh, mortgages, as a result of this uh, financial deregulation, you have this fantastic development of, of mortgages that were securitized, that were packaged as uh, not only first as, as mortgage-based securities and then collateral uh, debt obligations and then credit default swaps and all these uh, some of these derivatives that have been called by Warren Buffett the arms of the, the weapons of mass destruction, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, in 2006 you have uh, problems starting to appear, uh, inflationary pressures, uh, increases in interest rates, and this leads immediately to, um, to uh, a, a stagnation in the evolution of prices of real estate, and you start seeing interest rates to uh, hike and um, massive defaults and foreclosures as the bubble of real estate prices erupts and you get the beginning of the global financial crisis. In fact, a very important note, it's not only a financial crisis and this is something that needs to be uh, repeated. People think it's financial crisis, it's confined to the financial sector, it's not. Look at the very at the thing at the, at the top. The, the main item I have here is you have indebtedness grows because wages stagnate, and wages stagnate because there are macroeconomic forces playing those wages. Okay, so this is a macroeconomic and financial crisis. Not only a financial crisis, and certainly not a market failure crisis. Okay. Um, so, we get this uh, crisis um, that's not going away. By the way, uh, you may read uh, a lot of the business, uh, international business press, uh, a lot of talk about recovery and, you know, maybe things are not perfect, but at least we are sort of getting out of the woods. Uh, I don't think so. Okay, I, I, I really, if you look at the data, and I'm not the only one that says this, you know there is a big debate, okay? Um, the leveraging is continuing in the U.S. Um, incomes continue to stagnate, 
Even though the U.S. got out of, uh, you may have read in the newspaper a week ago, the Federal Reserve uh, decided to uh, quit its um, quantitative easing program, its uh, flexibilization of monetary policy, buying assets from banks. Um, and a lot of people think that, hey, you know, this is like, uh, this is a sign that we're really on the road to recovery, uh, the U.S. economy is growing, uh, employment is 5.8 or 5.6 percent, something like that. Uh, well, you know, uh, we, if you look deeper into the data, uh, you will see that, uh, again, the leveraging continues, wages are stagnant, the unemployment rate has gone down because a significant amount of people have stopped looking for jobs. And if you stop looking for a job, you are not counted as unemployed. Okay? You're not kind of somebody, to be unemployed you need to be seeking actively for a job. A lot of people got tired and simply dropped out of the labor force. Um, and um, the rest of the world is in dire straits. Look at Europe, look at Japan. I won't go through the details. If you want to discuss some of these things in detail, we can do that. China is the world's largest real estate bubble, it, it harbors the world's largest real estate bubble. And uh, the only reason it's not exploding uh, right now is because uh, it, it, I mean, banks have been able to contain, there is a lot of opacity with, with uh, the lack of transparency in the data from banks, and investors don't have a lot of alternatives in uh, China. So. Um, the effect of China slowing down on emerging markets is also is going to be, it, it's already important and it will become more important in the future. Uh, a very important consequence is that the discussion on sustainability, and of course we are all concerned with sustainability. In this conference, this is the, the, the key word, everybody uses this word in every sentence, more or less, but in the global debates on economics, uh, we are not sitting at the table for these things that we discussed, and sustainability is not a key word anymore. The, uh, the, the key priority is recovery. It's not sustainability. Okay, I think this is really, it has a lot of ramifications and a lot of implications. Okay, what I wanted to do here in this talk is to explore that the relation between macroeconomics and urban change, and I think uh, it's important to uh, spend a couple of uh, slides on what is macroeconomics, what are macroeconomic policies, <coughs> excuse me, and what are their effects, and then look at some of the key features in the uh, global economy. So, uh, macroeconomics, um, I think, is important because it examines the working of an economy as a whole, as a unit. Um, it, it uncovers the rationale, of the, the dynamics and dynamics of the entire model. Uh, which is something that sector level analysis is, un is unable to do. So if you study agriculture or if you study fisheries or even, I don't know, uh, things like the banking system in, in an isolated manner, you will not be able to understand what are the dynamics of the entire model, how it works, and I think this is a crucial thing the political economy of the model. Who wins, who loses? Because if we miss that, we're going to be talking about mechanisms that are apparently, what, politically neutral? I don't believe in that. I don't think these mechanisms are politically neutral. And I think we need to meet that the challenge of talking about the political economy of macroeconomics directly. Now I can expand on that uh, as we go along during the next uh, couple of days. Um, Macroeconomics also allows us to analyze the dynamics of economic aggregates. And by the way, uh, be careful with the word aggregates. It, it doesn't mean that we aggregate the rationality of all the individual agents in the economy, and therefore we get like a, something like a big consumer, you know, the so-called representative agent used in macroeconomic models. It doesn't work like that. If we aggregate individuals, According to the rationality of textbook economics, the aggregate result does not respect that rationality. So, aggregate means quantities, it means the results of accounts. It doesn't mean that, you, that the economy behaves like an individual. 
a big individual, the collection of all of us. It doesn't work like that. Macroeconomics is a different ball game. Okay? Uh, so let me go very rapidly. We can talk about eco international economic relations, uh, uh, economic policies, and of course, things like crisis and instability. If we don't do macroeconomics, it's very difficult to talk about the crisis because the crisis involves the entire system. Okay, macroeconomic policies, look at the things that, that are affected by macroeconomic policies. The rate of activity, employment, uh, resource allocation, expenditures for environmental stewardship, income distribution, inequality, poverty, wages, and key relative prices are affected by uh, macroeconomic policies. The, the way an economy is inserted into the international economy and therefore the usage rates of natural resources. And they also affect structural and economy-wide transformations. Things like migration patterns okay, and industrial restructure. And I think these things are very, very close to the whole issue of cities and urban change. And uh, so my conclusion is macroeconomic policy should be uh, at the center of any discussion on environmental and social sustainability. And that includes, of course, the role of cities in this process. Okay, some examples of, monetary po of, of macroeconomic policies. First, monetary policies, including the, uh, everything related to credit and the financial sector. By the way, things like who creates money is uh, there are a lot of myths about you know, where does the money come from and the role of the private banks and of the central bank in money creation. Fiscal policy for revenues and expenditures, incomes policies closely related to inequality trends, um, economy-wide prices, balance of payments, uh, deregulation, etc. Uh, but surprisingly, macroeconomics is absent from the discussion on the Millennium Development Goals. I suspect it will remain absent from discussion on the Sustainable Development Goals that uh, I think Karen was talking about a, a while ago. Uh, we, we need to make sure that they are not. They have, they have to be at the center. Things like poverty, hunger, education, they're closely related to macroeconomic policies. Um, climate change. Mitigation and adaptation, closely related to macroeconomic policies. The IPCC recognizes that poverty equals vulnerability. And when it comes to uh, expenditures for adaptation, they have some silly calculations that grossly underestimate the need for resources for adaptation. When it comes to mitigation, they simply do not discuss the environment, the macroeconomic policy environment for technical change and investment that you require for mitigation. And I already spoke about Rio Plus 20, so uh, maybe let's consider two reasons why maybe macroeconomics is not included in these discussions. One is that macroeconomics, a perspective from macroeconomics, invites controversy. Because just what I said a while ago, you immediately start discussing the political economy angle of how the model works, the entire model works. Okay, uh, and second, there is a big, big problem with the state in which macroeconomic theory is today. I don't want to go into that because I teach so many things, so uh, if we have some time, I'd be glad to go into this. It is a very important part of the equation. Let me go very rapidly through five key features of the global economy that I think are important for uh, urban change or cities and they involve a macroeconomic perspective. So very rapidly, the first one is going to be the dominance of finance capital. Second is the role of macroeconomic policies and the, the posture, as we say in macroeconomics, that we have in macroeconomic policies, which is a very passive posture. Uh, we're going to be, we should be talking about massive global imbalances. This is the difference between surplus and deficit economies in the world. Uh, inequality crucial thing now very uh, you know uh, very present in the media after the uh, the book of Piketty uh, came out uh, but it is a well-known uh, process dating from many years ago and then uh, the whole question of instability and, and crisis 
Uh, I don't know if I'm going to be having time to discuss all these features. Uh, Roberto is telling me that uh, like time is, I have like one more minute or maybe something like that. I'm sorry? A couple more minutes. Well, very, just very rapidly. Then. I mean, I, I think that um, if, if we look at each one of these and the slides that I have, maybe later on in one of the breakup sessions we can, we can discuss this. Uh, it, it, I, I sort of explain what I mean by the dominance of finance capital. It has huge implications for the way the economy, the world economy, will be uh, functioning in the next uh, years. Uh, and we need to do something about it. We need to incorporate these things into our discussions on sustainability, whether you're concerned with cities or with small scale agriculture. And for me, actually, there are two, maybe two. Uh, sides of the same coin, okay? Uh, but if you look at some of the items that I have here, you will see immediately recognize that this is really important. It, finance capital dominates macroeconomic policy today. So this is one stark reality that we absolutely need to incorporate in our discussions, analysis, research. If we don't do this, I think really uh, we're gonna be missing a, uh, we're gonna be missing the votes. That, that's, that's how I see it, okay? Um, the global imbalances, this is another critical aspect of the world economy. Uh, there is no auto automatic reabsorption mechanism of surpluses. You have China, Japan, Germany uh, pursuing uh, neo mercantilist policies of, of accumulating huge surpluses. And it is in, in this manner uh, exporting their problems of unemployment to the rest of the world. Okay? So, this is another critical thing that has uh, uh, tremendous implications for the ways in which uh, economic structures are uh, operating in the rest of the world. You have a passive macroeconomic policy posture that needs to change. The big, big paramount, paramount objective of macroeconomic policy in the world today is not sustainability. Absolutely not. It's price stability. And macroeconomists are obsessed with this thing, okay? There is a huge discussion about these things in empirical macroeconomics and research and in macroeconomic theory. Okay, we, we have a huge battle going on. This is really, macroeconomic theory is a huge battleground, okay? But there is one thing is clear that I think 85% of macroeconomists will tell you that the key policy priority is price stability. Forget about sustainability, what is that? It will come, it will come as a byproduct of price stability. Forgive me, I don't buy that at all, and for many, many good reasons. Um, okay, I have to move on very rapidly. The question of social inequality is with us today. It will be reinforced and intensified with the current macroeconomic policy package that we have with this priority of price stability. Okay, and because the way price stability is uh, attain involves increasing social inequality. And we can talk about that later on. Okay, let me then go very rapidly uh, towards the end. Um, I think that, um, well, how do these macroeconomic uh, features affect cities? Uh, I think there is, this is a big area for questions, debate, and I think more research, and again, excuse me if I'm saying things that are very obvious or that this has been taken care of. I don't know the literature, so you will please correct me on these things. Um, I think the only uh, thing that I would say is that um, you have things like uh, greater inequality coming down the, the pipeline, you have, you will need more bubbles or more episodes of asset price inflation in real estate prices to grow. This is, this is how the US economy was growing for the last 25 or 30 years before the crisis. You're gonna continue that because aggregate demand is not based on wages. Wages can, will continue to be stagnant, okay? And you will have more crises and more volatility and more instability. And I don't think this helps um, I don't think this helps. Let me get rid of these slides. So I want to show you the final one. Uh, 
I don't think this helps sustainability at all. Just one final word. I think this is to underline the relation between macroeconomics and the cities. I think the debate on macroeconomics is a heated debate already unfolding in the cities of the world. It's already taking place. Okay, I will leave it there. Um, this is a, a street in Greece, 2011. And uh, it's a discussion on macroeconomics. Exactly. This is what is being discussed here. Employment, jobs, austerity, fiscal policies, monetary policy, the euro. This is what is being debated in this nice peaceful picture. Okay, uh, there are some publications I would like to share with you. One of them is, can be downloaded on the internet, and the other one is a book. Uh, a little bit of advertising doesn't hurt. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Alejandro. It's been very you know, interesting and helpful to have a small reflection in terms of what the context, the global context of our discussion of organization and global government should take place. And as Alejandro just stated, it has big implications in terms of how we conceive we can move on to our research and the, how to conceive uh, new approaches to address this conversation. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Harini, again, that's what Good morning to all of you. And uh, thank you to Karen and Roberto and everyone else from Project for inviting me to be part of this morning's panel. I was asked to be one of the legs of what I would call a tripod. Uh, one lecture which we just had a, a wonderful presentation by Alejandro talking about global economics and macroeconomics. One uh, on environmental change, global environmental change, and the third one on institutions. So as the second leg of the tripod, I'd like to focus on how do we guide a new urban future? and. In this particularly, what is the changing nature of urban nature? So this is a night lights picture of the world and as we know, many of us use these satellite pictures to look at urbanization globally and in different parts of the world. We can see all this urbanization taking place in different areas but what we can also see and what I would like to draw your attention to is the variation, not the homogeneity. There is no homogeneity. And uh, there is there are different parts of the world are urbanizing at completely different rates. So as you can see, this is a graph that shows the rates of urbanization, both past, present, and projected. And you can see that the more developed regions are more or less plateauing out by about 2030. Most of the growth comes from what I would call the new urban, the less developed countries and the least developed countries. And this is where urbanization is going to go from something like 10% to 60%, 50% in the next couple of decades, which is a massive transformation. This also shows you where these regions of new urbanization are, and you will see that most of them are outside the global north really in the global south, in areas of Latin America, of Africa, of parts of Asia. So this is the new urban. This is an urban transition where mega cities slowly plateau out and the new land comes for these cities largely from growing cities which will become mega cities of the future as well as new cities, the small towns that, or small villages that grow into small towns and the small towns that grow into small, larger cities. This comes with a few associated processes that I argue will lead to the formation of a new urban nature. The first is that you get an increased blurring of the urban with the rural, especially so in areas that have been recently urbanized where the history of urbanization is not long enough that the ethos or the way of living, so to speak, becomes 
modern urban as we would consider it. It's, it's a lifestyle which is where the rural and the urban are increasingly mixed, where you have villages within the city and you have cities with their influence on distant villages. You, in this uh, new urban, you also have the local and the global opposing each other but also hybridizing in very interesting ways. So this is an area of Kali urban Bangalore where you have a sacred tree, uh, what is called an Ashwat Kate, where the village square with, with sacred trees where people would sit. You also have a young and uh, dashing Anul Chodhanega advertising the opening of a new gym in this area. So you have these very hybrid identities emerging in, these, in this new urban. And the third aspect, the new urban is highly vulnerable to environmental change because of issues like climate change, pollution, a lot of other processes, waste generation, because of global environmental change, but also because of local environmental change. And often these new cities do not have the institutions, the modern institutions developed that are resilient enough to deal with these situations. These, this new urban also has a high proportion of the world's vulnerable migrant workers, the poor, and really for cities to manage urban nature is going to be very critical for ensuring urban sustainability in this in the coming decades. So re to recapitulate, the 21st century is an era of new cities where you have increasing influence of the rural or the urban, where your local and global play out with each other in very new hybrid identities and where urban nature becomes especially important in providing resilience to global environmental change. Therefore, in this presentation, I am going to talk about two aspects. Firstly, how does this new urban shape the values, use and management of urban nature? In what ways is this different from, from what we've seen before? And what are the implications then for the research and the practice of sustainable urbanization in the 21st century? I will give you examples from the city that I'm most familiar with, Bangalore, my city in India, and uh, where we have a long-term program, probably one of the largest long-term programs in South Asia of an urban city where we're looking at ecological change over a fairly, what we hope is going to be a fairly long period. We have about a decade of research already. I'll look at two kinds of aspects of nature private and common. So let's look at the common first, lakes in Bangalore, which are tightly coupled social ecological systems. The photograph above shows you a very polluted lake, and the photograph below is the same lake that has been then cleaned up by a local community. Lakes, these lakes in Bangalore have a history of millennia, actually. If you look at some of the inscriptions in, around these lakes, they were created lakes by local communities, maintained by them, and there are inscriptions from 480 onwards for several of these lakes. And the city, being an inland city, survives on the water of these lakes, or used to survive on the water of these lakes. These were valued locations then for consumptive uses. You can see vineyards, you can see brick making uh, kilns, you can see fish extraction, grazing. These were the kinds of uses that the, exist around these lakes. There are also a number of sacred uses that, and cultural uses. This is a community pounding stone where you found a local millet called Ravi and the millet would use that and it's typically found near lake beds. This is a local migrant community which always moves from lake to lake. In their culture there's a goddess who curses them and to stay in her good uh, wishes they have to move from lake to lake and stay migrants. So they have actually house, they have houses where the women and children live but the men move from lake to lake and have small careers as locksmiths. This is a very integral part of the local culture. You have sacred stones, a lot of different traditions of worship around lakes. So these are very important cultural elements in the community's lifestyle. This is a heterogeneity of uses once the city becomes urban, once the very urban fringe takes over. Cattle owners come to graze their cows, bird watchers come for inspiration and to watch the birds. Migrant security guards come to watch their clothes. Office workers come just to relax from a hectic day's work. And how does this lake fulfill the aspirations of all these people? This is what happens. One of two things. Either planners take over. And you can see that they have a whole lot of things that are prohibited. You can't swim. You can't bring your pets. You can't drink alcohol or throw waste, understandably. But you can't bicycle around the lake. 
You can't, what they consider to be called damage to plants and trees is prohibited. But again, in a city like Bangalore, you always had migrant workers or all kinds of workers using firewood from these trees around the lake, always for survival. So when planners focus on very important cultural and supporting uh, provisioning and supporting services like groundwater recharge, pollution treatment, flood control, they are focusing on an engineering approach, using viewing this lake as a, a provisional of certain services for the city, but they are not looking at what it provides to its people. There are resident welfare associations, which is another form of protection. What do they do? They have landscaped lakes with inner fences, outer fences, with a focus again on recreation and nature watching. These are the services that urban residents find more appropriate. What does this lead to? This leads to exclusion of women like this who left the lake actually that was in the previous photograph and moved to this other lake which is just behind a large um, software company where they wash their clothes. There are grazers who can no longer graze their cattle or their goats in lakes that have been privatized and handed over, handed over to private companies for boating, urban recreation. There are fishers who are slowly seeing that their fishing contracts are not being renewed. So these are the communities that get excluded from urban nature, from the new urban nature. Let's move to the second example of private urban nature, moving away from the commons. Gardens of Bangalore have always been, Bangalore has been a garden city for decades and uh, people in Bangalore have a strong cultural affinity with the plants that they plant in their gardens. Bangalore is famous for its bungalows and this is an example of a bungalow and you can see the incredible diversity of plants that are here. If you look at this, there's a huge emphasis on useful plants. There are fruiting plants, ornamental plants are very few, medicinal plants, plants used for daily worship. You see plants are, you know, potted plants in uh, most strangest of places, you know, on an old sewing machine, in a tire, wherever you find the grow plants. Slums also, where you have, which is another form of private uh, space, but trees are centers of activity in slums where people, you know, this is congested areas, so you would plant only what is most useful to you. These are dominated by native species compared to exotics. And over 70% of the species have some useful economic attributes. People engage with nature in a variety of ways in these parts of the city. You would have an ant hill where you expect to have snakes, so those are protected. People feed ants with sugar. The first morning's rice is given to the crows. There's a lot of traditions associated with the preservation of nature in these old villages which then become cities. What happens when they expand and you get the new nature? You get apartments. And you can see, sorry. You can see this. Massive range of apartments with high, hardly any trees, just a few coconuts. So apartments have a very different aesthetic preference for palms, for variegated ornamentals because they look pretty at all times of the year. Planners, um, say, as well as apartment owners, have a similarity in the fact that they prefer not having fruiting trees, not having flowering trees. These are very traditional of the city, the useful trees. Because they say this is a nuisance. You have to sweep, you have to clean, you know, the fruits are there, the birds eat them, it gets messy. It's a very different concept of nature. It's, it's, a, it's a concept of nature that moves to the aesthetic. So what do we get from these two examples? If you come back, draw back to ecosystem services, what kind of services do, do ecosystems provide? And the Millennium Ecosystem Service Assessment, Millennium, sorry, the MEA uh, categorizes ecosystem services into three kinds, cultural services, provisioning services, and regu regulating and supporting services. Now what you find is regulatory services increase in value, climate regulation, water regulation, water and air purification. And of course they should because the city has a lot of environmental problems that a smaller settlement does not. And therefore, it seems obvious to an extent that these would increase in their requirement. What perhaps is not so obvious, but which seems to be taking place in the new nature, is that recreational, aesthetic, inspirational, and educational services become increasingly important, whereas cultural heritage, which is a very local service for certain kinds of local communities, becomes less important. The spiritual and the religious is a more complex issue. It decreases in one sense, traditional rituals go away, but there's also, and that, this is where the local and the global interact in different ways. Many people in cities 
around the world fear that they're losing their identity to a soulless globalization. So there's often a resurgence in interest in religion, which transforms itself in many ways, but which still, so if you look at uh, ideal emotions in the lakes, these are large ones now, where you have idols of uh, 60 feet with plaster of Paris and lead paint and all kinds of contaminants, whereas you would originally make them with mud. So these spiritual and religious rituals survive, but in a completely different way. And I'd like to link this with Alejandro's interesting point and very important point, I think, on inequity. Because why do these changes take place? Who? I don't think it's just enough to say why these changes take place, but it's whose change are we seeing in the city getting reflected in planning? And of course, this is the planners, the policy makers in the media. This is where the big focus is on provision on regulatory services, supporting services. <coughs> The focus on the recreational, the aesthetic, the inspirational, the educational is by the urban elite. What goes away? The use is by the urban poor, by the traditional communities, fishing, raising, growing food, fresh water, fuel, cultural heritage. These are the traditional communities, these are the migrant workers, these are the people who get left out, who don't have the voice in the city. Of course you have contra responses, and I think the, the growing, growing global movement towards urban food which is largely a middle class and lower middle class movement globally, is a response to this, is a response to seeing the taking over of the city for ornamental use, and this is across the world that you see. You also have resistance coming from things like sacred groves in city. And the point I'm trying to make here is these are organic movements that are not by planners, or this is not by elite who who intervene in planning, but this is a top, uh, bottom-up sort of intervention. Therefore, I'd like to conclude with what does this tell us about the changing nature of urban nature? And I'm stating a hypothesis here. It's not definitely a proven hypothesis. It's my own hypothesis. But I have been talking to several colleagues in different parts of the world, and I believe similar stories can come out from elsewhere. Old nature has a greater support for a diversity of uses provided largely by native species. And these uses are important for the poor as well as for the rich, for the vulnerable as well as for the secure. The new nature has a greater focus on ornamentation, on recreation, on regulatory services. It ignores the significance of provisioning services, cultural, spiritual services. These get endangered. Endemic species in cities get endangered. And what happens as a result is that as the rural transforms into the urban, we will see increasing changes in this direction. And this will lead to an increasing vulnerability of not just the city, but specific sections of the city. And this is very important for the sustainability. This is the, the, the trends that I'm describing are particularly relevant to the global south, but I do not believe they're exclusively the property of the global south. This happens across the world, you know, within cities there are all kinds of pockets of growth. So I'd like to lay out some questions for the future. How does the new urban, which I argue is characterized by increasing urban rural connections, increased globalization, and increased environmental vulnerability, how does this impact sustainability? Because if we do not understand this, we will not understand what we will face in the next decades to come. And for this, we first need more research in different cities to get a better understanding of this process, which we have definitely documented in Bangalore, which I have a sense is taking place in other cities around the world. To what extent is it taking place? How does this change from, from location to location? And how does it change within multiple, multiple groups of actors within the same city? And finally, how does this lead us to better action via urban interventions around nature? I would argue that this tells us that you should not merely have diverse planning by planners for the poor, but this means that you must have cities that are planned by diverse audiences for their own needs, with nature coming in in, their own, in its own diversity, in its natural diversity, the way people want it. Thank you.
Um, and precisely the third presentation deals with the issue of the social dimension and particularly a focus on inequality. It's really unfortunate that Director Guimaraes cannot be here. So what I would like to do is just try to do justice to his presentation and, and mention briefly some of the key elements that he has in, in, in his uh, PowerPoint. So basically, Roberto Guimaraes set out four key issues to, to talk in his presentation, increasing socioeconomic inequality, social education and conflict. From two points of view, one, the global dimension and the regional and national similarities. The second one is the urban socioeconomic challenges. The third one is the mercantilization and surplus value of nature. And that thing is symmetry is global. Uh, global. Um, the social distance has increased dramatically, almost spontaneously, in the last five decades, from 30 times more wealth between the top 20% and the bottom 20% in 1960 to 20 times more in 2014. If in 1990, 345 persons had wealth equivalent to 50% of the world population, today one fourth of these persons amass the same proportion of wealth. This gives you a good illustration of the, the issue of, of um, inequality. <clears throat> um, conversely, there has been an, an improvement in overall economic development in the two last decades. The numbers of countries with low and medium human development have declined, whereas numbers of with high and very high have increased. Compared with the rest of the world, Latin America and the Caribbean has been the most successful region in the reduction of inequality, even though inequality remains in high, high in many countries of the region. It is worth noting that in many countries, the reduction of inequality occurred, but in income poverty and multidimensional poverty dimensions. In addition to worsening the wealth gap, between and within countries, even though inequality has grown, mostly between countries, while inequality within countries declined overall, both internal and not state conflicts account for the vast majority of conflicts worldwide. The number of conflicts had tripled since the end of World War II. And one, if one takes as an indicator the Human Development Index, there has been a clear association between improvements in the countries with most cohesive societies, and it has been shown in many studies increasing inequalities is one of the most important single factors affecting coherence in most countries. This two black slides show, um, illustrates uh, the global dimension of global inequality. In this one, a cursory picture of the global situation. This slide show simply how often a brief summary that has been said as so far. We know specific detail in sorry. So basically these two these two uh, slides illustrate the very good point of inequality at the global level. <coughs> One other way to illustrate this is how inequality within countries and between countries has increased. The countries of Latin America, which account for approximately one third of the world population, shares less than 7% of the world wealth, where Asia, Europe, and North America, housing the prevailing population of Latin American countries, share almost 85% of the global wealth. In other words, 
14 times more than other American countries. <laughs> but it's not only in comparison of other American countries and industrialized countries, it's also other regions of the world, as you can see in this table. Uh, the increasing importance of inequality across uh, the regions. He has also some comparisons in terms of what it means the reduction of inequality within countries, and he used the case of Brazil, his own country, uh, as an illustration. The evolution of SER in Brazil in terms of reduction of socioeconomic inequality in the past decade has been held as one of the most successful countries that coupled no economic growth in the midst of economic crisis since the, 2000, since the year 2000 with income distribution. This to the live show. Uh, but the point that he tries to make is that even with the those countries that where income uh, that has reduced uh, in inequality within the country, uh, Brazil still offers a remarkable example of failing to translate social progress in the improving of quality of life in urban areas. And this is an important uh, element within the discussion that we are currently having. And some of the points that he illustrates here. Uh, uh, it's interesting that how in some of the policies that address issues of, of increasing, for instance, the middle class, uh, over 40 million persons since the economic crisis, has implications also when it comes this translated into uh, uh, urban areas. Like the uh, tax exemption and tax sales as part of the economic practices to stimulate consumption, and how that is translated in a different quality of life within. And this is an interesting uh, uh, slide uh, that increases also the, the perspective of inequality. Uh, 43,000 enterprises that control 37 million of business around the world in the graph within the inequality is not only shown within countries, but also how we need to other sectors of society, in this case industries. Uh, also portray part of those, those, those inequalities. Uh, it's interesting that uh, 147 enterprises, 1% of the total control 40% of the wealth of the four enterprises around the world. In the issue of mercantilization and the surplus value of nature, he addressed the issue of that is called in the literature the land grabbing, land grabs. Uh, the world has witnessed in recent decades the greatest concentration of wealth and power in the hands of increasingly few transnational corporations, particularly financial capital, as is illustrated in the case of land grabbing. The new phenomenon of land grabbing indicates not only the increasing mercantilization of nature, or rather how the surplus offered by, to capital by nature, exploitation, has become more per perverse than the traditional forms of capital accumulation based upon labor surplus, so well studied by Karl Marx. Unfortunately, no viable solution can be offered by the goal of nature to the world unites, because nature has not learned to organize autonomously to defend its interests. In its, this absence, nature and, and social, as, a, as a social actor manifests itself not only through crises such as climate change, but also. <clears throat> and this is just some, some of the elements that he said. Unfortunately, he's not able to really explain or make justice to what he's trying to say with his uh, presentation. But uh, why does society take this disastrous? Uh, and he goes to the um, the work of, of um, uh, Jared Diamond. The examples of action to tackle the asymmetries of the recent waves have turned up the seminal work of Jared Diamond about how societies fail to address challenges and end up producing its own collapse. It is worth <coughs> reading here the second paragraph of the slice of increased, oh, sorry, my own instructions. <laughs> uh, it's where uh, <clears throat> persistent failure to deal with the challenge due to its incapacity to anticipate the problem before it emerges. 
to perceive once it is real, to, communi to communicate to the entire society, and to solve and overcome the threat once it is perceived. To conclude the, the discussions, it's worth uh, reminding as well that differently to uh, past societies, we have collapsed. If we collapse now, the entire global society collapses. In a sense, we all are Eastern Island today. So I'm sorry I couldn't make very justice to this presentation, but uh, let me just conclude here with the presentations and open uh, for questions and comments for the three panelists that would like to well, the two panelists. So, Some of the issues of uh, green cities, sustainable city, resilient city have, have 
started to be considered, but it, it matters of how do you want our strategy of implementation. And um, that's what I would like to add also to uh, William, William uh, comments on uh, future research need. I think uh, since we know now, I mean, like uh, cities in the global south are, are becoming more urbanized, I think uh, researching on uh, medium and small scale cities are, are important along with these characteristics, which Narada called urban, uh, new urban uh, style. And I also uh, uh, understand a better understanding of the relationship between global and local relationships. I think it's not just only uh, communicating with but between local stakeholders, but also moving from global to local. So how would uh, we uh, we improve direction of local of global science into local decision making, for example? What about what's the role of a local a global uh, private organization in supporting local government? I think uh, that's. So that's how I, I, I can see some of the future research on the city's circuitness. Thank you. Olivia Bina, again from the University of Lisbon. Just a quick reference to the first speakers, Alejandro, uh, on macroeconomics. I think you made a very good service to us in reminding us of the elephant in the room, a certain extent, uh, or what I like the expression of a scholar, a British scholar, calls economics the tutor of governments, perhaps tutor of more than that besides. But the point I just wanted to share, um, two thoughts. One is that you did not mention the, the need of our current system, global system of consumers. And um, I want to refer to the case of China, that I, is one of the areas that I do research in, where the whole debate about the need for urbanization, which is a core policy of the government, is directly, explicitly from the president down referred to as the need to create consumers, a consumption society. So nothing gets closer to being problematic for us in this context than consumption. And so there you have now squared the circle to some extent. So yes, I think you raise a very important issue. And, uh, and <clears throat> in that sense, I can also share the, the experience uh, that in discussing scenarios for future urban sustainability in China over two years, in workshops and surveys, I have never been able to move away from economic drivers, not once. And environmental, ecological ones are issues that come very, very much down to debate. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, uh, good morning. My name is Chan. I'm from the University of Hamburg, Germany. Um, I have a question for Harina. Um, you mentioned that it's still lack of communication before uh, between the government and the local communities. I wonder if there are any the local communities have they have any um, initiatives to organize an association for themselves to make themselves make their voice sound because if from the top down approaches. It doesn't work. The plan, the plan for the poor in the end is to the community get cut off. Maybe there's another theoretically there's another bottom up approach. Thank you. That's a very important question. I think the, the, the challenge that we have in cities is that there is no homogeneous community. Not to say that there is a village also, but uh, it's even more of a problematic in the city. And the problem is. There is communication therefore between the government and the community, but it's a particular kind of community. It's the kind of community that is wealthier, that speaks English, that has connections to the officials, that can use email, use the telephone, go and sit in the office and you know, call on a network really to make the government listen to them or speak to the media. And the community that gets left out is the community that, that uses all these traditional services. So it, the challenge is more how to link this community with that. There are initiatives, for instance, there are organizations that work with uh, slum residents and they have a pressure group. So there are obviously 
pulls and pushes a volcano as you will have in any city. But uh, unfortunately, the, the balance of power still rests in, in certain groups pushing their agendas on the city. Um, Stephen Lees, uh, Colorado State University in the US. Um, Harini, you mentioned the um, urban ruralness that's taking place in the in the cities. There's a sort of flip side to it that I think Jonathan Rigg at the National University of Singapore has written about, which is the urban, the rural urbanness that is starting to be seen in certain rural parts of the world. And I think it's a really interesting dynamic that these two things are moving together and there may not be a separation in the near future between rural and urban. It may just be this one large system that we're looking at. Just an observation. Absolutely. And I, Karen and uh, Dagmar have this very interesting special issue with the land where they actually put together a collection of papers looking at this whole urban rural. Is it a divide? Is it a continuum? What happens to rurality in the city as well as urbanness in distant rural locations? Yeah, absolutely right. We're seeing a larger blurring of this and maybe eventually all voices. There's a question on uh, consumption in China. Uh, I think it's, it's a very interesting, question, uh, very interesting uh, point um, that you raised because th there is a disconnect in, in China's uh, policies for structural transformation uh, and its macroeconomic uh, performance. If you look at it, it is true that there is, or there appears to be, this goal of um, increasing urbanization and this has implications for consumption. If there is a disconnect uh, between this uh, perspective of things and the fact that you have very low wages, part of the, uh, part of the question related to uh, arbitrage and cost, cost with what producers and attracting foreign investment to China, and also disconnect with the fact that you have uh, real estate as a critical element in capital accumulation in China. So this is why China is sitting in the world's largest real estate bubble that will make you know, the, the, the subprime prices look like a picnic. It, it really will in the, in the US. So there, there are these two different aspects that, that tell you the, the tremendous amount of distortions that go on at the macroeconomic level. And that have real implications at the, at the, uh, for the real economy and for spatial organization and um, cities and, and agriculture, etc. So there are these very uh, critical tensions inside China. Uh, and as I mentioned, we didn't have time to go into details, but certainly this has to be analyzed also in relation with the role of banks and, and the new reforms that the uh, what was it, the 18th uh, Congress of the uh, Chinese Communist, you know, People's uh, uh, Communist Party of China, in November of, uh, 2013, whereby they, they are really going to be opening uh, <coughs> the Chinese market for foreign investment. Now, the, the big disconnect here is with wages. You will have to do something about wages, and this will have to introduce a, a very, very important transformation in, in China. We'll, we'll see what happens, but it's, it is really a very critical point that could be raised. Thank you. I think we have time only for one more question. Yes. Um, uh, John Robinson from the University of British Columbia in Canada. I want to ask a question about the implicit assumptions about the role of policy and decision making in these kinds of analyses and sort of what might be called the Hebrew of the research community um, with regard to, to that issue. Uh, Brad Allen B. and Dan Sarowitz from Arizona State have argued persuasively in my mind that um, one of the implications of thinking about uh, cities uh, or socio-technical systems in general as complex adaptive systems is uh, the quality of emergence and the inherent unpredictability and uncontrollability of these phenomena. And if we take that seriously, uh, surely that has fairly big implications for our views of our role um, and our views of, indeed, the role of policies. Uh, 
these are systems that are not, in fact, controllable in a kind of enlightenment-based way of uh, management, um, even understandable in those terms. And surely what we're, or what we're reduced to, perhaps, is small interventions of an experimental kind that may indeed, in fact, will indeed have unanticipated consequences. And so it's more of a process of kind of surfing the waves that we are not able to control or even understand. And that does not suggest a completely different view of the role of the research community in contributing to an experimental process of innovation without this kind of sense that we can actually manage these processes and somehow make it all work out or make it be sustainable or make it be macroeconomically rational. Very, very. Uh, I, I can agree more with uh, what you're just saying, and uh, I would just add from a macroeconomic perspective: it's one of the things we know about the dynamics of capitalist economies is that they are inherently unstable. And this, of course, mainstream macroeconomics doesn't like to hear about these things. But if you look at the theory and you look at the data, and you, you, you know, there's a lot of data performance of these economies the last. In the last 300 years, it is very clear they are inherently unstable. 